So this is a this is actually a talk that I have given at the Smoky Mountain workshop back in August, and uh, more recently um, did this talk on a on, on an open snappy call. So uh, I believe there's probably a couple of people in here that have heard this before. So feel free to stop me, ask questions. All fine. And this is. Um, um, like Pasha was saying, this is about making some IO extensions to the Open Shmem library. And we were really targeting um, persistent memory modules. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out here with the problem statement to kind of frame up what we were, what we were really trying to solve. And what we were looking at the situation was that in terms of programming models and in terms of hardware, the traditional model gives us this nice separation where we have, you know, we think of data being in memory and an operating system knows what memory is and we move data over a network. And so we have all these semantics and protocols to move our data. And then when, and we store data on disk and then it sits there um, as a file or an object. And um, at the point where we start getting into distributed applications, especially data analysis and things where we're really got a lot of communication and coordination going on, lines really start blurring and things get complicated where you may have um, you know, RDMA registered pages that are part of your memory and they're um, got network mounted file systems. So the network and disk are merging into memory of data that moves over the network, but then it gets the network behavior reacts to how IO storage devices are uh, behaving and, and all this memory access that's going on between processes in a um, distributed application. And then um, moving over onto the disk side, you may get all this IO activity based on what's happening in network and memory. You have block devices that are, you know, being have data that's being cached in say the Linux um, block cache, and that might be far from the physical device. And then if you really want to talk about persistence, then you have to make a lot of effort to ensure that what is on disk is what you think is on disk. And uh, it's, um, uh, you know, so bringing all of this together, we're trying to look at how to, in this context, really ensure that we can have uh, persistence for workflow models. So the workflow model is one where we're using files as this universal communication medium. And this is great because any programming language that can write a file can be part of this workflow. And the file semantics tend to be very intuitive for people. It, you know, even people that aren't really, people that are say domain experts in a field but aren't computer scientists, they understand a file, this is a thing, this is an object. And they, when they look at a file, they, the semantics of the file make them think, oh, there's no matter how many processes are accessing this file, it's just the one file. But this then can lead to some very poor practices because the file semantics are enforced by mutexes, re remote procedure calls. There may be, so an application may start making a bunch of file access that, that is um, um, very difficult for the actual um, distributed hardware to handle. And there's um, some examples here, workflows that, that are, um, you know, very well developed and critical applications. We have a lot of graph applications. We have these very large persistent data sets and, and they tend to be processed in phases. So each phase sets up the next phase and that kind of creates the workflows. And then in biology, also very common to use workflow models where they have because in their field, you know, they've got these official curated databases. So they really are file dependent from the outset because they have to make sure that they're working with something that's um, accurate. And then they tend to pull those files down and do phases of analysis on them. So this is this is a pretty commonly used model for these types of applications. So we were looking at how to benefit from some new technology that would let us blur these lines between memory, network, and storage. And in particular, we were looking at the uh, Mellanox Bluefield SmartNIC and the NVDMN um, uh, module uh, 
technology. So basically the SmartNIC, now now being called DPUs, we had a, a 16 core um, um, processor, we have direct access to memory and attached storage. It's integrated into the InfiniBand adapter and it runs a full Linux stack. So running full Linux stack was great because we can now um, go and run run UCX on it. So, and then the NVDMN module fits in the DDR slot and it un appears as this unique PMEM type in Linux. And you have to use the Linux DAX extension to file systems so that when you use this device, it looks like a file system, but then when you memory map files from it, they um, behave just like memory. And this protocol has a uh, battery backup as part of the specification. And so you're writing to DRAM, normally volatile, but then it has a little enough of a battery so that if you experience system failure, it'll flush everything out to, um, uh, to flash. And then you can also flush things out to flash explicitly yourself. So the challenge is, is that we want to maintain the notion of a file because this works for people. Um, we want to let people access at the byte level. And so we want memory level speeds, byte level access, persistence. And we don't want to have a lot of overheads because the, the whole point of this is that we want it to be fast like memory. And we, we're notionally thinking that we're not going to have a huge PMIM de deployment, right? Then we're going to expect some sort of backing store because the PMIM modules are um, uh, just more limited in, in size and, and also in um, just ability to integrate into the system. So this work contributes this uh, client API, which we integrated into OpenShmim. The connection API to OpenShmim lets you open up dynamic connections, which isn't currently part of the OpenShmim spec. We have a PGAS server implementation that's built on UCX and is, is lightweight and we can deploy it on a smart NIC because it's it's low over to it in terms of computation. And we did a performance evaluation on a test bed with the Mellanox Bluefield smart NIC. And we had NVDIM in modules loaded into the smart NIC itself. So this is the uh, client server design, uh, how we put this all together. We have a, uh, what we call the F space server F-Space server is just built on UCX. It's very thin software stack. It's meant to run on top of a uh, um, just a pretty vanilla Linux, but you need the uh, uh, DAX enabled kernel. And we expect there to be some IB fabric there available for the server. And the client, we took um, uh, and integrated into an op the OSSS OpenShmim implementation, a, an extension to connect to the server and perform memory operations. So the OpenShmim spec itself defines these memory-based communication semantics on processing elements. And each of our processing element has a nice unique PE number, so we can just put and get things by number. And this extension presents that file space with PE numbers. So we can keep using all of the same open shmim, put, get, semantics, everything should stay the same. Um, it's just that some of the PEs will be only for reading and writing and they won't be doing computation. And the the PEs for the F space aren't global in the sense that normally when you start up open shmim, every PE sees the same set of PEs. But because we want connection semantics and because in a real world, we may have different storage that's disaggregated, spread across the system, may not be exactly uh, uh, a perfect world. So we want to have the flexibility so that the PEs that you see for storage may not be the same across um, individual um, uh, Shmim PEs. And so the connection protocol, we just want some transparent remote access to these fixed memory regions. We have a handle to an F space and special value so you can test if your connection failed. We connect uh, with this connect function and there is a uh, connection structure, which in our implementation is just the IP address and port because we're connecting over IP over IB. And then uh, the um, disconnect function just simply um, cancels all of the open files, cancels everything out. And when a PE connects to an F space, 
every PE that connects to that same F space will see the same number of PEs. Like, so the number of PEs on the F space is fixed, but they may, the PEs may connect in different orders. They may connect to different ones. So one PE may say, oh, this F space is 16 to 31 for me. Another PE says, oh, it's 32 to 47 for me. And, um, you know, the way this is implemented, we don't intend there to be just this rapid fire connect, disconnect over and over and over again, because that would tend to lead to some fragmentation, right? Because you, you would have to then at that point start compacting your PE ranges. Well, but, but the use case here is really that you have a system and when the application fires up, it can kind of configure itself at the outset and then it just runs, but there's not a lot of connect disconnect during runtime. And uh, in the future, we could um, potentially provide collective connections, right? And then you could have your global numbers for F-space PEs. That's just not part of the current implementation. So files themselves, you have a file struct. And when you open a file, this is kind of a, a combination operation. It's, it's like halfway between a file open and a allocation. So when you go to open a file, you just like with any file open, there's a file name and file size. And then in this version of the um, IO protocol, we're using the uh, PE sets, which is the previous way that OpenSchmim defined subsets of PEs, which is you have a start, stride, and size. In addition to that, we have a unit size, which gets into file striping, um, and then an error code that's returned. So essentially, if you, if you specify a file name that's a path, and the um, smart knit can see that path, like it's got a file system mounted on it, it will, it will understand that, oh, that's a file that's stored in a backing store and it'll cache in data from that file. Uh, if not, if it's just some string, now it's just sort of an allocation and the size is used to determine um, uh, how big that allocation should be. And there's uh, some more semantics to if the file on disk is bigger than the size that you indicate and so forth. It, essentially, it will ignore the size if, if, uh, if the file is smaller than the size and it'll fit it. If the size is smaller than what's on disk, it won't uh, exceed that and your, your file in, P, in the F space will get truncated. And then there's a close operation where you close out your file and um, which there's some semantics regarding um, file open, uh, the ability to shrink and, and grow files based on how many processes have that open. So we don't want to invalidate the mapping of the file as seen by HPE. And so the IO flags we'll get to later have to do with uh, how the close occurs and uh, whether or not there's some sort of blocking. And then the stat function updates your file pointer fields. So this gets into uh, something fundamental about this implementation that makes it feasible on uh, SmartNix, which is that you know we're doing things lazy. We're not we're not giving a bunch of you know we're not sending a bunch of traffic back to the client of the F space to update all these things. Instead, we are ensuring that while a client has a file open, nothing changes about the file that will affect this client. And so the stat function will update things. But other than that, like if the file grows, there, the size on the uh, um, PE with the file open isn't going to reflect that. Uh, so we'll get to that next. All right. So uh, the IO flags um, have to do with a couple of things. First, there's this, this issue of, like I said, we were targeting NVDIM in. And in general, with storage, there, there are the uh, different levels of persistence. And we want to be able to explicitly flush files at periodic you know, points in the application and to ensure that they're persistent. And so we have this um, pop flush and deep flush. The pop flush is flushing the file essentially to the flash on the DRAM module in our case. But it would be that you're just flushing it such that if there's a power loss, the file is still in F space. Deep flush has to do with the backing files. So if you give it a backing file name, that's a real path. Deep flush will push all the data all the way back to backing store. And those are both those are both blocking, right? So if you do a flush operation and you give that flag, the flush will not complete until the uh, um, operation is complete on the remote end. 
The dialloc is to allow a user to manage the file space so they can indicate that they're done with this uh, file and it can be flushed back out and free up the space. Otherwise, the file will sit there basically like a cache. So it's like a user controlled cache in that sense that once you open a file, it's going to sit in the F space until either a user explicitly pushes it out or if the F space runs out of room as it's opening file and nobody else has a file open, then it will flush it out. Um, and then we have a wait operation. So this is a way so that essentially if you've got multiple applications all connected to the same file space, but they're not the same application, so they don't see each other's PEs. They can't do things like barrier or any kind of synchronization between these two applications. But if they've got shared files open, they can use a wait flag so that you can actually um, have some notion of consumers producer semantics between full applications. So that you know, if, a, if one application is a producer, it could close a file, wait for everybody to close it, another application could use a similar type sequence of operations to wait till everything's closed and then pull the data out. And so um, this is enforced on the server side. So it doesn't have anything to do. It's not in anywhere in the OpenShmim implementation. It's just part of the UCX uh, server side uh, protocols. All right, and then we've got some um, operations to uh, flush the files, which I kind of was describing already, where we're going to use those IO flags to determine where and how and what to do with the file data once it's flushed. And then there's a truncate and extend that are different operations. And this isn't really a performance issue because we can't truncate a file to be shorter than what is perceived by any uh, PE that has the file open. This has to do with the fact that we don't want to send a bunch of traffic to PEs that have files open. So if a, file, if a PE has a file open, it's going to expect this file is a certain size. It's going to be able to read and write data to anywhere in that range. Therefore, if we were to truncate it, the PE would have a false notion of where it could read and write. And so truncate will not, uh, will actually um, fail if there's other PEs with the file open and this would shrink the file. But you can indicate a wait flag to say, Wait, wait until you know everybody's closed this file out and then truncate. And extend is uh, always safe to do because you can always grow a file. And if some PE thinks that file is smaller than what it really is, that's not going to make it um, perform bad reads and writes. And it can always do an F stat to figure out if the file maybe uh, had grown. So bringing it all together, here is an example program, and the um, when it says assume all layout hints taken, the PE sets as well as the um, unit size are all hints. And so in this example, if we send a negative one, that's just server's choice, make that parameter whatever you like. But if we send a value, that's a hint. And in this example, you know, you, there's a way to check for this. So if you if you in a real program, you would error check and you would open your file and then you'd have to actually check and say, oh, did is the layout what I thought it was? So that's omitted here. So first, uh, first line we here have a file name and the um, let's see ah yes. So we got two files that we're going to open, and the then we've got the server connection protocol. So that would all come in on command line arguments. Call shmim init. The client initialization, everything about the um, shmim side client is all wrapped in shmim init and shmim finalize. So for example, if there's any open files or any, any open file spaces, once shmim finalize is called, it'll all get cleaned up. So we call shmim init, uh, initialize the library. We acquire uh, the PE number and number of PEs. And then the um, shmim F space, the FID is the um, file hand or the F space handle. So we connect to the F space. Then, then it's gonna open this FP1 which is a file that is just, um, it's the size of number of PEs times the number of ints. So we have one int per, per PE, and it's just going to be one big contiguous range. So it's not going to be spread across multiple PEs on the F space. And in that case, then to put and get to that file, 
there's this FP adder. And so FP adder is how we are using the file space with all of the pre-existing shmim put and get. The shmim put and get and all of the memory operations use an address. And so we've essentially just mapped the file space addresses just like we would for any remote PE. And the uh, so the shmim int put will use the file or we'll use the file address which is calculated to be the integer for that specific PE based on its PE number. And then it's going to store its PE number there. And since there's only one PE being used at all for the F space, that would be the FP PE start. So this is one way for PEs to share a file. Then we have the FPN, which is the second way for them to share the file, where we open a file, same size file, only this time, instead of one contiguous region, it is a uh, it is spread across however many PEs are in the program. And we're assuming here that this file space has the same, you know, more at least as many PEs as what's in the program. That would be something that would have to be error checked. So we uh, then in that case, instead of calculating the address offset like above, each PE will simply perceive its file pointer to be um, the current, you know, related to the PE's array on the F space. So in that case, then when we do a put, instead of instead of putting based on offset and then all putting to the same PE, we put to the single address and then the data is mapped based on PE number. So that's why the last argument is PE start plus the PE number. So this is basically showing that you can either stripe this file across NPEs on the F space or you can put it on a single NPE. And in either case, you can use the existing Schmim semantics to read and write a single integer um, at basically the same memory speed you would for any Schmim program. All right, so we implemented all of this and um, ran it on this um, Bluefield test bed. So here's the test bed setup. We have the SmartNIC, which is this uh, Mellanox Bluefield, it's the Blue Whale SDP. And so that had a, a way to load DRAM directly into it. We had 16 gigabytes of NVDM in, it was a pre-production module. We also had 16 gigabytes of regular DDR. We also had 16 gigabytes of the embedded flash. And we had a, it was a ConnectX 500 gigabytes. There's a firmware version. Um, and on that SmartNIC, we were running CentOS 7.6. We had to patch the kernel due to the fact that when we started this project, there was a lot of uh, missing functionality in the kernel to support DAX and PMIM on um, the uh, ARM processors on the SmartNIC. And so that was uh, the, that's the, the, the nature of the patching there. And we were using the inbox IB verbs. So both uh, both a F space server and an NFS server were running on the SmartNIC. The server that was running the OpenShmim client had a, uh, it was a Marvel Thunder X2 two socket system, had 256 gigabytes of DDR4, um, and it was a, that was a RHEL 7.5 running MoFed drivers, and it had a ConnectX4 VPI. So. We um, uh, then ran the, oh yes, and then the Thunder X2 was set up with SMT configured to one thread per core because uh, we were kind of emulating a more HPC type of setup. And so we weren't um, interested in using SMT for this experiment. Uh, and then this is talking about customization. We had to use ODP because the DAX files won't work with regular memory pinning and because you could move you can move DAX files around and by the file system, but ODP let us get around that. And the um, uh, we had to patch the firmware to get NVDIM in changes, changes. That's all been upstreamed. And the kernel patches I mentioned have also all been upstreamed. So you can use PMIM with ARCH64 now. So our benchmark was a, um, a kernel that reads, sorts, and writes back graph data. And so this is based on a bucket sort, and the edges in the sort were um, tuples. So and it, each edge was was sort of vertex one, vertex two, and 
uh, a weight. And we didn't use the weight, but this was the file format. So uh, we had each of the in, NPEs would randomly generate um, some number of edges. And then in parallel, they'd bucket sort the edges. In parallel, they would all access this giant graph data file. Each PE would output the metadata and edge data at a fixed offset. So, so we have one shared file and each PE is accessing a set portion of that file, which is more or less the, the nice thing about this bucket sort from the, um, from the outset. Um, and then the second part of the workflow is we do an update. So in parallel, all of the, um, all of the PEs are accessing the file. They then write a bunch of randomly new edges into the file and uh, so that you have to resort it. And then application three resorts it. So, uh, and there's a note about application two was that this was so slow on NFS in terms of, you know, having, because we were, we were simulating how you would need to make this persistent. So every time you did a random write to this file, you'd have to sync it just by the nature of what we were trying to accomplish, but it was so slow, we couldn't really make a fair comparison. So the comparisons are all about application one and three, where all of the output is this giant bulk output to be friendly to NFS. Um, even though we could support, you know, doing all of these uh, all of these writes uh, individually for the F space at about the same speed. So we um, um, and then there's going to be three sets of results where um, I'll I'll talk about them more later. But essentially, we've got the app one total time, which is generate write sort, app three total time, which is read and sort, and then we've got we're going to compare generating versus reading. And then we're going to and then we're going to talk about just the total time to bulk write all of the uh, data sections. So the sort itself, we have um, uh, this is a weak scaling graph. So our our uh, linear or our ideal line would be a perfectly flat line, you know, because we're raising the size of the data set with the in in lockstep with the number of workers. And so what we show from the F space is that when we go up to 28 cores, we don't really see like a significant slowdown versus two cores. And, but when we use the file IO, and this is just multiple cores on one server talking to an NFS server over IB fabric, the, um, there's about a, a slowdown that is uh, sublinear, but still significant. And it's the slowdown is uh, worse with worse with read because read is also um, uh, is reading sorting and writing and then the and then the slowdown is um, not as bad with the generate because it doesn't have the read step and then um, this is a comparison between regenerating the graph versus reading the graph and so this was just really talking about how you know are we actually able with the with the F space? We're actually able to more quickly just pull data off of this cache across the network than we are to run random um, uh, a gazillion times to make new edges. And and so the the whereas the file I/O very quickly becomes slower. And so it's just kind of driving home the point that we're actually faster than computation for this test case. And if you had sort of disaggregated memory throughout a system, then for a workflow situation, this is what you want, right? Like you really want to be able to read and write these files very, very quickly from nearby as part of your compute flow. And then um, because the NVDMN modules have volatile memory and RAM and you have to actually flush. So every time we do a put operation to NVDMN, we are also running this blocking flush that tells the server to flush everything, waits for the NVDMN flash to be updated and then returns. So we're not, um, so we're not just using the volatile part of the, of, the, of the RAM in these tests, we're actually doing the flush operation as well. And the flush operation is much more efficient. And in our implementation, the flush operation essentially contacts the server, the server will cache line by cache line execute a hardware instruction that triggers the NVDMN to flush that cache line um, in memory and then we'll return to the client. 
uh, whereas the F-Sync operation with file I.O. is a much more significant slowdown. All right, so summary, the, the you know, in terms of implementation, the way we're, we're able to really keep this efficient is to let the smart NIC be mostly passive. It mostly sits there, does management, trades around information between PEs, and then it reacts to these client requests so that all the clients are essentially using the smart NIC as their file semantics um, point of uh, um, control. And then we don't do um, a lot of, we don't push file status updates to clients. We instead enforce the fact that the clients need to let the file, you know, keep the file where it is and not have it change size until, until that makes sense. And then you have synchronization that's the programmer's responsibility to handle. And um, yes, and the OpenShmim client lets us have byte level access because since we expose it as PEs, that brings in all of the existing OpenShmim memory semantics. And we can have large files be accessed in parallel because we just calculate addresses and it more or less works like a memory cache at that point. And uh, by using the PMIM as, our, as NVDMN, we have this memory device behavior through all this existing Linux stack and on-demand paging. So we, you know, now that we've upstreamed all the patches that we had to make, the 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 this mechanism just works with what what's already existing. All right, and I think um, I think I'm about at time. Uh, I've got some notes on future work here, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop now and. If there are any questions?